Good morning, their excellencies, the president of Korea Foundation, ambassador of South Korea to Sweden, the Swedish Foreign Ministry, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the ISDP Korea Center inauguration. My name is Sang Soo Lee, a head of ISP Korea Center uh, officially from today. <laughs> First of all, uh, I'm so pleased to announce the launch of <coughs> Korea Center at ISDP. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Korea Foundation for its generous support for this event and our future work on Korea. We all have recently seen a very, very positive development in the situation, security situation on the Korean Peninsula. Actually, we have seen a lot of high level of tensions last year, but there is a big expectation for resolving North Korea's nuclear issue. And now we are very much eager to keep this positive momentum. I believe ISDP will be more active and uh, we can do more meaningful, for, uh, meaningful work uh, with aim of contributing to future peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Past, uh, over the past years, uh, leveraging as a Swedish think tank, ISDP has established a functional network with uh, scholars, think tanks, and uh, policy makers both in Pyongyang and Seoul. With its unique position, uh, ISDP provided a platform for dialogue, information, and the joint research among the regional actors, especially between South and North Korean scholars. ISDP will keep this work uh, to become a bridge between North and South Korean scholars, even if the situation will be up and down. However, uh, South Korea actually faces not only security challenges, but also there are many domestic issues, such as aging problem, social welfare, and economic uh, development, and sustainable development. I think there are many areas lessons can be learned from Nordic and Swedish experience. Furthermore, I think there are more potentials and the rooms for deepening for their relations. However, uh, in spite of this, for historical geopolitical reasons, there are too few exchanges between uh, two regions. Therefore, ISDP will narrow this political and the physical distance between the two regions. Today, uh, our uh, inauguration event will start with uh, the congratulatory remarks by Xi Young Lee, uh, the president of uh, Korea Foundation, and uh, ambassador of South Korea to Sweden, Lee Kyung Gyu, and then uh, Henrik Bergqvist, uh, uh, head of East Asia Department at Swedish uh, Foreign Ministry. And after these uh, introductions and the remarks, we will continue a seminar on Nordic-South Korean relations for peace and development on the Korean Peninsula. Actually, uh, the seminar will have two different sessions. The first session is about the uh, relations between Nordic and South Korea. And then second session is about uh, the peace and security on Korea. So, but between the two different sessions, there is a coffee break, so please enjoy the Swedish Pika. 
And then now I hand over this to President of Korea Foundation for his speech. Good morning. Um, I arrived very late last night, but I am full of energy this morning because this is a part of my uh, sentimental journey, looking back of my uh, years in Stockholm uh, back uh, 15 years ago. I lived in Stockholm uh, quite briefly. That's why I still uh, remember uh, all the good memories of Stockholm because I left right before winter started. <laughs> so um, I'm very pleased to be in Stockholm. Uh, well, afterwards, I lived here and there uh, in Europe, but somehow this is my first return trip to uh, Stockholm since 2003. Well, uh, dear uh, Mr. Nicholas Vanstrom, Ambassador Lee, Mr. Henrik uh, Burke is from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and all the other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning. It is my honor and privilege to be with you today in congratulating um, the opening of the Sokolom Korea Center here at ISDP. First of all, allow me to convey my warmest congratulations to the leadership and staff members of ISDP on this very special occasion. As a representative of Korea Foundation, I'm very proud that the Korea Foundation has been in good partnership with ISDP for many years and will be even more so through this center from now on. I'm certain that this center will be a platform for in-depth career-related research and the exchange of ideas, contributing to peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. With the establishment of ISDP in 2007, as I understand it, Mr. Nicholas Vanstrom, together with Dr. Sang Shu Lee, founded and developed a strong Asia program. I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for their dedication and passion toward advancing the study of Asia in Sweden, in particular their focus on Korea. I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that ISDP contributed to keeping the channel between the two Koreas connected by organizing the 1.5 track dialogues among the six party talks countries. These dialogues were rare and precious opportunities for government officials and scholars of the South Korea because most channels with North Korea have been disconnected for the recent several years. I believe that ISDP's effort to offer a forum for communication have helped prepare us for the conversations we are currently having with North Korea. And I'm proud that the Korea Foundation was able to play a small part in this process. Dear friends, indeed this inauguration could not have been more timely given the considerable developments on the Korean Peninsula currently dominating the world headlines. Panmunjom declaration signed by the two leaders of South and North Korea on April 27th contains comprehensive measures for peace, prosperity, and the unification of the Korean Peninsula. It, however, represents just a first step on the road to peace. South Korea thus has to remain in close cooperation with the international community to establish a sustainable peace regime on the peninsula while making it genuinely nuclear-free. It will be a long and painstaking journey which would require not only strong support from, but also wisdom and experiences of international community, those of Europe in particular. In this regard, it was a good signal that the leaders of Japan and China expressed their full support of the Panmunjom Declaration at the Korea-Japan-China Trilateral Summit on May the 9th in Tokyo. In addition to frequent uh, telephone dialogues with the U.S. President Donald Trump, South Korean President Moon will visit Washington, D.C. to uh, have a face-to-face -face talk with 
President Donald Trump on May 22nd, just to make sure that both sides are exactly on the same page in dealing with North Korea. It is no secret that there are skeptical views as well about the uh, uh, sincerity of North Korea's intention to give up their nuclear weapons and missile capabilities. If history regarding North Korea's nuclear issue gives any lesson to us, this skepticism can be justifiable. There are, however, several aspects that we see for the first time in 65 years of divided Korean history. Most of all, North Korea proposed a summit to the U.S. through South Korea, and it was accepted for the first time. With the summit less than one month away, there are already many positive signs exchanged between the two sides, including some concrete and bold measures taken by North Korea. Of course, we are still at the very beginning stage of our long journey to permanent peace on the peninsula, yet this sudden and most welcome thawing of relations has hopes running high. Not to lose this precious momentum for peace, South Korea has been working hand in hand with its partners from the beginning to realize a new free, peaceful Korean peninsula. Well, let me return my gaze to Sweden and ISDP. Sweden and Korea are looking forward to celebrating the 60th anniversary of their diplomatic relationship next year, if I'm not mistaken. But even before our diplomatic relationship began, Sweden uh, played a crucial role in modern Korean history. 1953, Sweden, along with other three countries, began to monitor the ceasefire of the Korean Wars as part of uh, NNSC, New Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. In addition, as Sweden has maintained relatively stable relationship with North Korea, Thanks to its art of diplomacy, it is perhaps one of the most likely Western countries, I believe, to be approached by North Korea once they open up the country and want to transform it into a normal member of international community. This is another reason why this opening of the Stockholm Korea Center is so special. It is even more special since the ISDP is believed to have due respect from North Korea since the Institute has housed diplomats and scholars from North Korea for the recent several years. In partnership with this ISDP, the Korea Foundation wishes to promote peace on the Korean Peninsula through dialogue and cooperation. I thus expect continued support and interest from ISDP on the long journey ahead. Today, through our two panels, as announced, it is my hope that your fresh and creative ideas will guide our critical first steps. Your valuable input will contribute to strengthening our bilateral relationship and building peace on the Korean Peninsula. Once again, congratulations on the opening of the center and thank you for the invitation. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. supposed to introduce our uh, esteemed ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Sweden, my long-time colleague, Ambassador Lee jin of uh, uh, Korea to Sweden, please. Thank you very much, President Lee. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, uh, really a great honor for me to be uh, personally in introduced by uh, President Lee of uh, Korea Foundation. Uh, because uh, he is uh, senior to me uh, in the uh, foreign ministry. He, he worked in the uh, Korean foreign ministry for uh, more than 30 years, and uh, he's uh, a seasoned diplomat. And uh, I always uh, wanted to uh, follow his you know, uh, career uh, path. 
So it's very, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to see him here uh, in uh, Stockholm, where I'm actually uh, serving as an ambassador. And uh, um, very happy that uh, I could see all of you here. Um, Director uh, Nicholas uh, Svenstrom, President Lee Xiang of Korea Foundation, Mr. Henrik Perkist, Head of the East Asia Section of the Ministry <coughs> for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and <coughs> Ambassador Vars Lars Varier, Dr. Sang Su Lee, and distinguished guests and <coughs> colleagues. It is my pleasure to give this uh, remarks on the very special day of the inauguration of ISTP Korea Center. First, uh, let me extend my heartfelt con congratulations and the gratitude to the President Yi Xiang and his staff of Korea Foundation who made this project possible. My special thanks also goes to Director Nicholas Svanstrom and his fellows for the diligent works. Indeed, the launch of this Korea Center, which is the first uh, in kind in Sweden, is long overdue given the excellent bilateral relationship between uh, Korea and Sweden. As you may be aware, next year marks the 60th anniversary of uh, establishment of uh, diplomatic ties between the two countries. In our tradition, 60 years in life has a very special meaning. It is the year <coughs> which completes a journey of life cycle, and at the same time, it also means a new starting point for another one. For the last six decades, our two countries continued to develop cooperative and friendly relationship and witnessed many successes in various fields. Politically, Sweden has been playing a very important role for the peace and security of the Korean Peninsula based on the trustful relations with both South and North Korea. I believe Sweden has uh, contributed to the success of the Inter-Korean Summit on the 27th of April as well. As well. In, in the economic field, thanks to the free trade agreement between Korea and the European Union, Korea has become the third biggest trading partner for Sweden in Asia. And now more than 90 Swedish companies have successfully nested in the Korean market cultural area also starts to reap the fruits of cooperation. Certainly we have plenty of assets and potentials to further strengthen our cooperation, not only for the better future of our two countries, but also for the world peace and prosperity. Both of us cherish and promote universal values like democracy and human rights, and we also have the similar development path and economic structure. We are highly dependent on trade and promote free trade. We have unlimited source of human talents and we spare no efforts for promoting innovation. We also have strong aspiration for peace and uh, security. These assets and potentials will certainly lead us to become the most ideal partners. However, at this moment, we should not forget that our friendly and cooperative ties need to deepen a mutual understanding between the two countries and strengthen aspirations for the better relationship. In this uh, respect, ISTP Korea Center has indeed a lot of important role to play. Even though peoples of our two countries have broaden their understandings on each other, we have to admit that it is not as yet um, as deep as uh, what we could expect. In particular, the image of Korea in Sweden has been overshadowed by the tensions and conflicts with South and North Korea, while there are plenty of other diverse sources for research. I hope ISTP Korea Center will provide Swedish people with many useful analytical information on Korea with its comprehensive and systematic studies. 
not only on the security issues, but also on various important topics like uh, economic development, uh, cultural diversity, and most importantly, about people's life. Distinguished guests and colleagues, there is an old Korean saying which goes, well begun is half done. Today, we are witnessing a strong enthusiasm of people of two countries for the better and deeper understanding. Once again, I congratulate the successful launching of ISDB Korea Center. Thank you very much. Shall I? Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to do it? Okay. Um, so next we welcome to the stage uh, Mr. Henrik Beckless, head of the stage section of the Swedish Foreign Ministry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. President Lee, Ambassador Lee, uh, dear colleagues from the ISTP, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Anyong Nashim Nika. It's uh, a great honor for me to be here today to attend this uh, inauguration. I'd like to thank the ISTP for uh, the invitation and your continued very uh, hard work on many issues, including the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are here today as a kind of ex uh, expression of the very close ties between uh, Sweden and the uh, Korean Peninsula as a whole, uh, as uh, we have heard. Uh, our ties are a, uh, uh, a demonstration of the fact that uh, physical distance is no obstacle. Despite the uh, uh, distance between us geographically, uh, the uh, ties between Sweden and Korea go back a very long time. Uh, for natural reasons today, uh, our, uh, much of our attention in the past uh, several uh, months, of course, has been dedicated to the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, uh, and that situation too does, of course, as we have heard, uh, uh, hold a particular place in our ties. We've heard of the uh, Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, uh, starting uh, in 1950 with the beginning of the Korean War, Sweden also dispatched a uh, field hospital uh, to Korea, which was operational until 1958. And we continue to hold a large presence uh, on the Korean Peninsula and a commitment uh, to pursuing uh, peace and prosperity there, with embassies in both uh, capitals and the NNSC. We have had an embassy in Pyongyang since 1975, uh, of course, uh, which has generated continuity in our contacts with uh, the North Korean government. And we have provided humanitarian uh, aid uh, to the uh, North Korean population in response to their needs. Today we all have an obligation uh, to help contribute to resolve the situation on the Korean Peninsula. While we pursue all of the decisions of the UN Security Council, including by implementation of the uh, sanctions uh, adopted in response to North Korea's actions, we must recall that the UN Security Council has also determined that there must be a peaceful and political situation, a solution to the situation. And in this light, uh, we have all welcomed uh, the progress uh, in inter-Korean relations, including the summit between President Moon and, and Chairman Kim. We hope that the upcoming meeting between President Trump and Chairman Kim will, of course, build uh, on this momentum. Sweden, on its part, uh, remains ready to help out uh, if asked. Meanwhile, uh, our relations with the Republic of Korea, as we have heard, continue to flourish. Uh, we share, uh, and I agree fully with uh, Ambassador Lee, uh, the shared values of democracy, human rights, and an open economy. And indeed, next year, we will celebrate uh, 60 years of diplomatic relations, uh, a very auspicious uh, occasion. Our societies and econ economies are very similar in, in many ways. Uh, 
Uh, we are open market economies dependent on, on trade, a high degree of innovation, uh, omnipresent uh, information technology. Uh, and we share an interest in issues like smart cities and uh, green solutions. Cooperation in this regard on climate change is, is central and the South Korean government has of course adopted plans to increase the share of renewable energy in South Korea's uh, economy. We are encouraged uh, by the uh, EU, a Republic of Korea Free Trade Agreement, uh, which entered into force a few years ago, and uh, very much, uh, as uh, previous speakers have said, want to pursue even closer uh, trade ties. Our ties have developed uh, very well for several years now, as it is, uh, which is an indication of how compatible our economies uh, are. We now need to stand united on the merits of free trade and to counter any protectionist uh, movements which exist. Both Sweden and the Republic of Korea share a commitment to multilateral uh, uh, cooperation, including in the security area, which I think we will hear more about uh, later this morning in, in one of the panels. Of course, uh, no ties uh, are fully sustainable without a foundation in popular support. And here, uh, it's safe to say that prospects are very good too, which I think we'll hear in, in, uh, more about in, one of, in the other panel. More and more people in Sweden, uh, those of you who live here and know, listen to uh, K-pop, eat bibimbap. Men, women, pensioners, youngsters, my own children, uh, walk around with uh, Samsung uh, cell phones. Uh, <clears throat> We understand from our embassy in, in Seoul that there is a, a, a general, uh, generally strong level of interest in uh, Swedish society and Sweden's economy. In, in South Korea, you can hear Korean on the streets of Stockholm, of course. Uh, tourism is developing uh, very, very well. Personally, I have, uh, being a fan of football, I have very strong memories from the 1980s uh, and the legendary South Korean uh, football player Cha Bum Kun who was a big star in uh, Europe in, in the 1980s. All of this means that there's a very strong foundation for cooperation between our countries and a solid interest uh, in Korea in general, in, in Sweden. There is a wide range of topics to study and to pursue further cooperation in. The ISDP Korea Center has plenty of work cut out for itself. I congratulate the Korea, the Korea Center and the ISTP on the establishment of the center and wish it the best of luck in its work. Thank you and kansamnida. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, we will start the uh, fourth session of the seminar very soon, but it takes in two minutes to change our seats. Cool. But uh, please, please uh, sit down. So please let me um, <laughs> begin by um, <laughs> Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce to you a distinguished panel uh, consisting of uh, Mr. Uh, Cho ki -jung, who is the counselor of the Embassy of uh, the Republic of Korea. We have also uh, Dr. Gail, Gail Helgesen, who is the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies in Japan, NIAS. And last but not least, uh, we have the Director General of the Swedish Institute uh, here in Sweden, uh, Annika Lembe. Please have a seat. <laughs> uh, we will um, discuss various issues uh, in connection with uh, not only Swedish-Korean relations, but Nordic-Korean uh, relations. Of course, uh, we will have a Swedish perspective of this as well. But uh, we will listen to various views on various topics, and I hope that you will also participate in the discussion uh, in the Q&A session. And we will move relatively rapidly to the Q&A session. Uh, 
so there will be plenty of room for, for questions and comments. Uh, let me also s introduce myself. I'm, uh, my name is Lars Barrio, and I'm the uh, former, former or earlier uh, Swedish ambassador to, to, uh, uh, no, sorry, to, to Korea. Uh, I was there from uh, 2006 to 2011, a very interesting period uh, uh, in history, I would say. Uh, 2006, North Korea uh, had their first nuclear test, and later on uh, there were various other tests and, and incidents. You had the Chonan uh, sinking in 2010, and there was the bombing of the Yongpyong Islands. Uh, and so at certain times it was very, very tense. But at other times there were, there were signs that were hopeful. And I think that uh, in my view, uh, so far, this is how it's been. Uh, it's been tensions building up, and then less tensions, and then ten tensions building up. Now we have a different situation, we hope. Uh, but viewing back in history, we have to be a bit careful in judging uh, what will happen before it happens. Being an ambassador in, uh, in uh, Korea is, was a very easy job. Um, everybody said something positive when uh, I answered the question, where do you come from? I said, uh, I come from Sweden. Never, ever did anyone say, oh, everyone said, oh, is that so? And then they started to, uh, to say something positive about the, the Swedish-Korean uh, relations. And I remember once I went with one of the ordinary taxis in Seoul, and the taxi driver, after a few minutes, said, where do you come from? I said, Sweden. And he almost drove off the road because he turned around and says, good! <laughs> <laughs> so this was the, my experience in, in, in Korea. Very positive, very easy, uh, everyone was welcoming, and it seemed that uh, the Korean view of Sweden was, to say the least, very positive. I don't know if we deserted, deserted but it felt uh, as somehow we could use this positive atmosphere to create various things. Uh, so, uh, during that period also, the Swedish interest for, for Korea grew, I can easily say. Um, not least because of K-pop, as you mentioned, and um, other cultural uh, um, things happening. Uh, Korean literature uh, has been growing in, in Swedish translation uh, ever since, uh, I don't know, since the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, so it's, it's Korean literature is becoming uh, well established in the Swedish uh, reader's mind. But I will not take uh, too much time from the distinguished panel, and I would like to uh, turn to the panel uh, with a, a question, beginning with a question uh, that you can comment on, and that is uh, ha that has to do with with the Nordic. Uh, Korean relations. In, in, in your view, is there anything that uh, one has to point at when it comes to the Nordic-Korean relations? Is there anything that is special? Is there anything that is needs to uh, be built on further? Or is there anything that you would like to comment on, simply? And we, we can start maybe with uh, Annika Rand. I will also ask some other questions later. Uh, specifically tied to your your uh, your job, but if you could just comment a bit about the uh, Nordic um, Korean relations, I would be very happy. Thank you, thank you so much, and, and and thank you very much for for letting me attend this very special moment. And I just have to say that Korea to me is part of my entire childhood, because my father was when of the Swedes actually uh, working since 1953 and then 1954 in the NNSC. So this has been, you know, part of, of every day, I would say. He's 93 and we're still talking about the development and what's going on. <laughs> Coming back to your question, um, I think, I'm glad to hear that you say that Sweden 
has a strong uh, position uh, in, in the minds of, 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 um, of Koreans. I think you're right, but I think there is something where, where Sweden and the Nordic countries together need to remember that we are still small countries far away and that we need to continuously develop and, 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 uh, and nurture relations. Um, relations are not given. Um, trust is not given. It's it's earned. And and um, what we see from from surveys we are doing in the area in in Korea is of course that the younger generation and the millennials, which are probably quite different from former generations, will maybe we will have to to act differently to really engage them. In, in further and, and future relation. So I think there is a potential, yes, but we have to remember that, that good memories are not necessarily something that will keep these relations uh, going on. Then I have to say that, that I think the Nordic countries could do probably much more in, in, in the collaboration. We tend to talk about our own countries very much, and the global competition is there, but the global challenges are much bigger than individual countries. And that's why it's so important that we both have a Nordic collaboration in, in our perspectives when acting together with Korea. But we also need um, really the collaboration uh, with many countries in order to solve and tackle the challenges, because they're not our own challenges, they're global. I would start there. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Cho, do you have any comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, first of all, for inviting me to this meaningful event, celebration, I, I would say. Uh, I think you know, uh, we have to remember that uh, Republic of Korea and Nordic countries are like-minded countries. My ambassador point out, pointed out a very important point, that we share the universal values. So this is very uh, important fundamental uh, for you know, broadening our our cooperation at the global level. So first of all, I would like to point out that you know we have a strategic partnership uh, with the European Union. So uh, please remember that Korea is the first and unique country which is signed the three key instruments of European Union, uh, namely uh, uh, you know free trade agreement, uh, framework agreement, and framework agreement for the participation in the crisis management of the European Union. So these three frameworks, you know, three which is a strategic partnership, provide us with a very important <coughs> basis for further uh, cooperation. So with this in mind, I think we can further promote universal values uh, to strengthen our basis for uh, cooperation further. And then also we can also enhance the cooperation to resolve global issues such as uh, climate change and poverty eradication, which is very important. And uh, finally, we can broaden cooperation for a safer and peaceful world as well. Thank you. I'm stuck. Thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, again, the director of the NIAS, uh, do you have any? Yes, you thank this? you. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for being among such distinguished crowd of people with interest in Korean affairs. I have worked on Korean affairs for 35 years. And uh, with my age now, I am, uh, I think it's acceptable that I start with a personal note. My first presentation in Korea was in 1988. I had been traveling in North Korea for several years. This was my first time in South Korea. I was asked to give a talk, and I talked about North Korea from my perspective. And uh, some people in the first row was actually leaving after five minutes. And uh, the sentence that they really hated to hear was that I said, in North Korea, there are human beings too. Nice people like you here. They didn't want to hear communist propaganda. Another thing that was striking was that the friendly guys came up to me after my presentation and said thank you, it was very interesting. But 
let us give you an advice. Um, you said several times in my perspective, as I see it, in my opinion, but you're a young guy. So you're not supposed to have all these opinions. <laughs> you can refer to others, elderly people. And I said, thank you very much. How old do I have to be then? <laughs> and they said, when you pass 60, as you said, you can have your own opinions. So I'm 68, becoming 69, 69 in Korean. Now I, I'm, it's acceptable that I have opinions. And my opinions are a little bit different from what we have heard before. I, I do not disagree in what you have said. And I very strongly agree with the Nordic perspective. We have to remember, even though Sweden is the main country of the five Nordic countries, we are small. All together, like Seoul and the suburbs of Seoul in population. So that is very important. And we can do much more together. Another thing is that we have to remember that Korea is far away. It's an old culture. We heard ambassador and president of Korea Foundation relating to Korean tradition in their talks. We do that too, and we have another tradition. And these two traditions are not always very easy to, to, to cooperate and to understand each other. We have to work on that. I'm a, I'm a cultural sociologist. I have used 35 years to try to understand Korea, South and North. And I have a long way to go. But I know that we are different, and I think we should appreciate differences and use differences by working together. That's my main thing. Well, thank you very much. Yes, do you have a comment on that, please? No, let me just add that I think um, I have a list from World Economic Forum here stating South Korea is the most innovative country in the world. We know that. Sweden number two, Finland number seven, Denmark number eight. So there is also a, a strong culture where we do have similarities. I, I completely agree that in cultural understanding is so important, and especially when we talk about cultural exhibition, mm -hmm. like uh, the Korean. But I think there is an area where we really could connect, and that is when it comes to, to how we together find solutions for the challenges that we all are facing. Thank you very much. Um, Let's build on that uh, and, and talk about um, hierarchy and uh, relations between men and women, also not only um, elderly people and, and younger people. I remember when, when um, I went to Korea, uh, I had this prejudice, uh, I must confess, that uh, the, the, situa the, the position of women was very much very, very much different from, from, from Sweden, and that uh, women in Korea would not express their opinion. And we invited some people uh, to our first dinner, and, and uh, I remember the conversation, uh, one of the, the men stated something very strongly, and then suddenly his wife across the table half-jokingly said, oh, don't believe him. Uh, I have my own opinion about, opinion about that. And I was really <laughs> surprised. And then it was day after day, I realized that uh, Korean women actually express themselves uh, happily and, and strongly. I'm not sure if that is a sign that the, there's a, a, gender, a, a good gender balance, but I would like to ask you uh, about your comments on the difference in gender balance between Sweden and Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, specifically also relating to the strong tradition of hierarchy in the Korean society. We are less hierarchical, I think. Is there a big difference there? Is there a difference that complicates things, or is it something that we can ignore? I think that is a very good question, <laughs> first of all. Uh, when I hear your experience in Korea, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, am I right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ten years ago, between ten years ago and now, we have a big difference, you know, 
already the composition of uh, working process yeah, is, is uh, very different. Yeah. So in my case, when I was uh, uh, in Seoul in headquarters of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, in the office we have more than 70% uh, of female staff already, female diplomat, you know. Uh, however, even though uh, we have not enough, uh, you know, higher, higher ranking officials, but we have a very strong basis for uh, expansion for uh, female diplomat. So maybe uh, in 10 years, we, have, we will have more, you know, uh, female ambassador. Uh, and that this is not just, you know, uh, physical uh, difference, uh, but, you know, mentality also changed a lot. So, uh, I personally experiencing, you know, in my family, my daughters uh, has different thinking from my, my wife. <laughs> so, uh, I think, you know, my children, they have totally, you know, how can I say, uh, on a par with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the maid, you know. So, uh, I think, you know, uh, again, uh, I would like to remember that we are like-minded. We are became more and more like-minded. So, as Sweden, uh, the, our society is seeking uh, parity between uh, male and female. That is the trend. Okay, do you have any... Uh, Mr. Uh, contrary. <laughs> um, but, of course, you're right. But I think that there is one thing that is different and will remain different and it affects relations between the sexes. And that is that we have this uh, ideology of being equal for, you know, in all respects. We do not really accept or respect hierarchy. Hierarchy is in itself against our thinking about what is good and and I don't think that happens in Korea or Japan or China including Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam, East Asia, the Confucian era era is different in that sense. And maybe we could learn a little bit about it. I sometimes would like to be more the leader of my institution in reality, <laughs> not only in name and name card. You know, because all have a lot of opinions about what I'm supposed to decide. And they expect me to follow everything, although there are ten different opinions. How can I do that? It's impossible. I have to say this is the way we, we go. But that's a problem here. It's not a problem in Korea. And I think that we could learn a little bit from that. Both in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. Well, I also like to decide in my organization. Um, however, I, I very often think also the young ones, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, that you were entitled to have a strong opinion already at a young age. Uh, now, coming back to, to gender balance, um, yes, we do have different histories and in, 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 in cultural history, and, and that goes, I mean, we have to remember that Sweden, <coughs> Norway, Denmark, Finland, the Scandinavian, the Nordic countries, are the exception very often. Um, I do think it's a good exception, maybe, but, it, but it's, we, we have to, to to acknowledge that we very often are an exception. Uh, however, the fact that women very often in most countries in the world are 60% of those leaving higher education with good exams are women around the world. And as far as I know, this is the same thing in, 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 in South Korea. It is in the Middle East, it is in, in Japan, in many, many other countries. But the workforce is not um, taking adv advantage, the society is not taking advantage of the fact that women have PhD exams, have excellent exams from all sorts of higher educational institutions, the best universities, and after a couple of years, they are due to tradition and due to lack of institutional structures in society, 
societies, countries, companies are not taking advantage of the economic benefit that that would do to them. And I think that is very sad for the economic development, both of companies and countries. And of course, I also think it's, it's very sad for the women, not given the chance to fully develop their, their, their skills and their potential. And I think it's sad for the children and the fathers not taking part on the family um, and, and have a full uh, family uh, situation. That's a personal view. The first two views is not view, it's stated economic facts. Um, so so I, I think there is a potential uh, there um, to actually take advantage of, of, of gender balance. Thank you very much. Uh, can we slightly shift the subject to uh, efficiency and, and uh, uh, when it comes to decision making uh, in organizations? I think that Swedes have a reputation uh, of being relatively slow when it comes to uh, taking decisions. And I think that Koreans have the opposite, uh, uh, the image of the Korean is, is the opposite. I remember the, the, uh, the, Korea is the only country where I have had to tell my secretary that she, she didn't have to run in the corridor. She, she could <laughs> slow down a bit. Whereas I think uh, in Sweden, perhaps the opposite would <laughs> be, uh, please run a bit more. <laughs> but I wonder uh, if, um, do you have that image that, that the Nordic countries and Sweden, uh, perhaps in particular, is a country that takes forever to take decisions. Is it something good in that? And is Korea a, a country where the deci decisions are sometimes taken too fast? Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you have any people running around in your corridors? <laughs> well, there is another relevant question. Uh, I think, you know, when I arrived here in Stockholm first, you know, uh, it looked uh, uh, like we are using different watches. <laughs> <laughs> different watches. So, you are right, totally right. The Korean people are very quick and fast uh, in decision making, sometimes too fast. Uh, one example is last week happened, you know. <laughs> so uh, last of our Friday, one of my colleagues from uh, the Ministry of Gender Equality, uh, she, he told me, she told me that, you know, the minister will come to Sweden and uh, uh, she changed a little bit of, uh, you know, schedule that uh, she not noticed uh, to me. So on Monday morning, she called again, you know, <laughs> already schedule is established. So I, I replied that, no, there was, you know, your uh, notification was uh, made on Friday, last Friday, and uh, Saturday and Sunday here, uh, they don't work. And uh, <laughs> this is a Monday morning. <laughs> so my, my colleague here, you will understand. <laughs> so that is, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, watch that we are using. But uh, in Sweden, Swedish people, uh, you know, Sweden is very well established society. So the system is working. Uh, of course, there is uh, people who are working, but in general, it seems to me that the system is working. So uh, it looks uh, uh, late, but stable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we, we have to mix a little bit of the two, yeah. <laughs> the system. So this is my experience. Okay. Director, do you have any? Yeah, I, um, I have followed a, a research project of uh, two large uh, technological universities, one in Denmark and one in Korea. I'm not mentioning names, but they are large and famous. <laughs> and there are two groups uh, working together on developing um, fuel cell technology for uh, the new electric cars. And I wait uh, and wait for because I want to have this kind of third generation electric car coming from Yante in Korea. Um, the the um, Danish group can actually decide quite fast, but when they start working, it takes time. 
the Korean group is actually taking quite a lot of time to discuss about how to do this. Uh, so it takes time and the <coughs> Danes are impatient. Why can't they just decide? But when they have decided, they work like crazy and they pass the Danish group and they are finished with their results long before the Danish group. I think that is also a truth from the differences between us. So both the opposite and this. So, so this is something that is also important in cross-cultural communication. There are not one truth. Sometimes the opposite is truth as well. That's my suggestion. Alicia, do you have any thoughts? More, I would say, a, a, a reflection from the time when, when I used to work with investment promotion and we met with many foreign companies coming to Sweden. And we tried to explain how it could be that we had so many days of holidays. And we had paternal leave. And, and, and we had so many... We, didn't we work at all in this country? But when it, we're looking at, at um, figures showing productivity, we could always um, actually find that Sweden had very, very high productivity. And, and why is that so? One of, of, of um, CEOs of, of one of the largest Swedish multinational companies, and he's, he, he's a foreigner leading this company, and said, you know, one of the, the reasons I think that Sweden, Swedes actually produce so much is that they have a fairly good work-life balance. Um, they do take time off. They do have their fika and, mm -hmm. and, and have their discussions at work. And they, when they take off um, to give uh, birth to a child, they take off a substantial time, which means that we bring in someone else to do their work. So there are a number of, of also, a part in our culture, in our system, that actually means that things are working, but we do it completely different. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that, that leads me to a question. Um, I once had also a, a <coughs> particular experience in Korea. I found that there was a food product, uh, I, I'm not going to mention which one, a Swedish food product that had potential in, in Korea. So I uh, contacted uh, a chain uh, <coughs> company in Korea, and they said, yeah, oh yeah, we would like to import this. And I contacted a producer, a small company in Sweden, and the company said, well, in that case, you have to, uh, they have to uh, import uh, one ton, uh, the equivalent of one ton of this product. And they said, yeah, of course, we'll do that. And then nothing happened. So I contacted them again, and they said, well, Actually, they had to import 10 tons. Uh, and I, I went back to the company, and the Korean company said, OK, we'll import 10 tons. And nothing happened. And then I went back uh, again and said, what happened? And I said, well, you know, if that kind of volume, we have to employ people, so it will just complicate things. So I think we will abstain from, from doing it. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> that leads to the question, is there, uh, do you see any specific uh, product or any specific area where we could increase our trade? Uh, between Korea, maybe uh, you have the same, you're missing maybe the Swedish market or the Nordic market, uh, and we are missing perhaps the, uh, the Korean market. I think, for instance, the, well, I'm not going to go into it, so. <laughs> <laughs> any comments? <clears throat> So I think this question uh, is related to the you know economic bilateral economic relations. First yeah. of all, bilateral economic relations has uh, enormously expanded from uh, since you know our diplomatic ties has been established. Uh, in 1965, I searched a little bit the statistics. Uh, uh, in 1965, the statistic was the oldest you know the available. So in 1965, uh, our project between Korea and Sweden bilateral. Our uh, trade volume remained at uh, 6.2 million dollars. And now in uh, 2017, 
our bilateral trade volume expanded to 2.6 billion dollars, which is enormous expansion. Uh, and then, you know, my ambassador mentioned about the you know, free trade agreement you know, between Korea and the EU. Uh, that was a, a very important turning point to uh, increase bilateral you know, uh, trade volume. So, in general, bilateral relationship is very good. But in these statistics, it reflects just you know direct uh, trade, as you may know, uh, uh, you may know very well. Uh, but uh, given the fact that Korean companies and the Swedish companies as well uh, are doing trade with Korea, uh, Korea, uh, certain countries within the European uh, market, so if we put together all these statistics, uh, I mean direct and indirect trade value, uh, to trade value will be much bigger. Uh, so, uh, with this in mind, I think uh, 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 we needed to uh, further, uh, you know, increase our cooperation uh, to, you know, come up with a new, new, how can say, new source of growth. We need new source of growth. Uh, the uh, very promising areas, I think, uh, in my view, is uh, everything, all areas related to uh, post-industrial uh, revolution and innovation. You mentioned, you know, the and I mentioned the uh, double score, uh, you know, innovate, related to innovation. But in 2018, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Innovation Index, uh, again, uh, you know, in this index, Korea and Sweden take, uh, has taken, have taken first and second place uh, for the second year in a row. So which means we have big potentials for the cooperation in the post-industrial uh, revolution and innovation, and, uh, uh, and secondly, we uh, since we have a, you know very sensitive uh, uh, awareness for uh, clean air or you know uh, environment more and more. Uh, uh, I think you know the clean energy and renewable energy and everything related to the you know climate climate environment is very promising. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I can only agree, I mean, the, the big areas in, in smart city development and others are, of course, areas where we would be able to find solution. I'm happy to see that I see much more Korean food in my daily food store. I'm also, I noted this morning, reading the morning paper, that one of the um, mid-sized Swedish retail chains uh, for, for uh, smart design, mid, mid not IKEA, but another design company, are opening largely in, in South Korea. I think there are actually um, a bilateral interest in design, which goes for Denmark as well, and Finland, and where there could be a potential, um, much, much more in, in that food is obviously one other area. So it ranges from, from the real high-tech areas to, to uh, also the, the daily life. Uh, the lifestyle part. Yeah. Um, my colleagues in Korea say that uh, if you could add Nordic to any brand, you could raise the price 30% immediately. Um, and uh, I think we can do much more Nordic uh, because of the size, because we are different, but we are quite good at working together. And we should do that um, much more. Uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers are my employer, and they have uh, uh, established a new uh, relationship with China. Uh, and everybody is looking at China because of the size, of course. If you could send, sell a ball pen to every Chinese, you were a billionaire almost. But I think this is uh, a kind of an overstatement on the importance of China. And we forget, for instance, the Republic of Korea with 50 million people double the number of the five Nordic countries together. So uh, that is very important. The other thing is that uh, when it comes to high tech, and again, now it's my age coming into it, I'm a little bit afraid. When I see in beautiful Stockholm people walking on the sidewalk, looking at their <laughs> cell phone and communicating with someone next door uh, of, of, about nothing. 
And I'm not uh, enjoying the weather, the beauty, uh, life. Uh, is this, should we work for this? Is this the future? Uh, maybe we should kind of hesitate a little bit and uh, make some kind of computer-free zones or some, some places where people can relax and enjoy life. I think that is something that we should consider at least. Thank you very much. Um, I realized we call this the Nordic-Korea relations, so you have just raised the, uh, the value of this 30%. Of it. <laughs> I will now uh, open up uh, for questions and, and uh, comments uh, from the audience. And, uh, we can take, you can take any question, you can direct it to um, any of the uh, ones participating in, in the panel. And uh, if you uh, don't mind, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, if you don't uh, introduce yourself, uh, no one will arrest you, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that we would like you to do. Uh, so in the back, I think, see the first uh, hand goes up. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Gabriel Johnson. I'm from Korean Studies at Tokyo University. I have one brief comment and then two questions. The comment concerns uh, hierarchy and it's just one example. When uh, Stockholm University got um, its first female president, there was an interview with her and she said that hierarchical structures within the Swedish academia uh, were working to the disadvantage of women. So it means that even if we have a bad opinion about hierarchy. It is something that exists uh, uh, because um, of um, a structure developing over time benefiting uh, men. So, so um, th that's the comment. And then the two questions, I'll take them briefly. Uh, in spite of Korea having one of the highest uh, working hours within the OECD, it's uh, almost uh, on the last uh, position in terms of work efficiency, efficiency, and this seems to me to be a contradiction. Can you explain the, the negative relationship here with um, higher working hours and, and labor productivity? And secondly, um, Korea is hardly um, in the media through uh, documentaries presenting the, the country, and if such programs are shown, uh, it's uh, about um, uh, inter-Korean relations or some other issues uh, in, in politics. But uh, in terms of making a country known to the general public, uh, the media is the most efficient channel, and I wonder if uh, something is prepared in this field to make Korean culture more known, since uh, China is fascinating for uh, Europe since hundreds of years ago, and China has ex uh, exerted so much influence on Korea, while if, if uh, Korea now be, uh, is uh, becoming known for K-pop, it creates a, a, um, a strange impression of the country because I don't know what is so, so special with K-pop except singing in Korean. And, and what, is the, what is the question? So the question is, uh, uh, will the embassy uh, do something to um, uh, make the media present something about an, an area about Korea that is unknown but should be known in, in Sweden to understand the country better? Is there anything that we are missing? <laughs> Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Johnson, uh, for your interest, strong interest in Korea. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, to reply to your uh, yes, second, yes. second answer. So, thank you very much for reminding us of a very important mission of the embassy. So, uh, you know, uh, my embassy already you know, mentioned that, you know, called the image of Korea is overshadowed and open by the tension and conflict with North Korea. So that is uh, unfortunate for us. So uh, we have, uh, you know, political dynamics, uh, social, you know, economic, you know, uh, diversity, cultural diversity and economic uh, dynamics as well. 
So the Swedish media is very quick to report on the tensions with North Korea or the Korean Peninsula, but they are very slow, uh, you know, to introduce. Uh, they are indifferent to even, you know, uh, to introduce uh, Korean economy uh, economic situation. Uh, although Korea is very important player in the world market, Korea is you know 11th largest economy and the sixth largest biggest exporter in the world market. So. Uh, we hope very much Swedish uh, you know, media are interested in those aspects as well. Uh, but as uh, you know, my colleague Hendrik said, there is no geographical uh, distance of war, which is obstacle uh, uh, to our relations anymore. But you know, we have indifference to overcome all the you know those peoples. So that is a big mission to be given. You know. Uh, ISTP Korea Center. I, we hope very much you will revive, you know, uh, overcome the indifference of Swedish people to Korean society. And uh, uh, to the first uh, question uh, on the matter of, uh, you know, too long working, uh, labor working hours. I think there, there is, a, you know, also big area uh, to, to improve. So well, we mentioned, she mentioned, Anika mentioned already the system of Nordic countries. There is a vacancy or you know, a person who takes you know, paternal leave. Uh, there is a substitute who you know, uh, sufficiently supplemented the works of, uh, for those who leave. But in our country, uh, you know, it's very you know, recent, very recent to introduce those system. And uh, we need to you know, complete the system. And with that system, uh, we can have less of overworking hours, uh, and uh, generation has changed. You know? Nobody <coughs> wants to work too much, so they would like to enjoy their life uh, with relevant you know, working time. So I think it's time of matter. Thank you. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm uh, on thin ice here, but um, because you know, I I just observe. And um, I think that there is a difference between uh, work um, life uh, balance in this part of the world and Korea. I have, um, of course, not been working on the uh, industrial sectors and, and stuff, but I have seen so many friendly relations between workers. Uh, on all different levels. I, I am not arguing that long working hours or working hours is good for Koreans. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we have a very sharp four o'clock or five o'clock go home, forget about your job. Where my colleagues in Korea say, hey, should we have dinner together tonight? And some of them say, should we have a second round? And <laughs> Maybe third round if it's Friday or Thursday. And, and this kind of life is a very important part of at least maybe not so much female life. And we have a problem there and you can take care of that. But male life. And I think it's very important. And we cannot just say, do the Swedish, take the Swedish model and be e efficient. No, no. Um, yes, please. May, may I just add to that? No, we can never say take the Swedish, the Danish, the French, the English model and use that in your country and think it will do the trick. Of course not. That's not what, what intercultural exchange and dialogue is about. It's about sharing experiences and it's about see how we can, in different ways, maybe learn from each other and, and, and create a better world. May I just add one quick comment on, on, on the media and the situation. You can never, ever, in any country, tell the media what to write. I've been working with promoting Sweden for 20 years, and that's not the way you would like to do it. I think facilitating tourism facilitating student exchange, research exchange, cultural exchange in all different ways, people-to-people -people relations. That's how you start, actually, to build knowledge and understanding and the interest and of another country. And the word of mouth is so strong and so important when we want to communicate uh, our respective countries. 
And, and so, so that is really, um, I think, just the fact that we're sitting here talking about our different countries is really very important, and it will bring us to continue to do that. Thank you. Uh, did you have a comment? Or? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Uh, there you have a uh, mic. Well, uh, sorry to take the floor. But uh, the first question, uh, two questions, which uh, I feel like uh, I, I'm obliged to say something. <laughs> Well, uh, the working hour, um, I, my last po posting was for an ambassador to the OECD in Paris. So that's a, a big, big, uh, big data uh, reserve. Yes, Korea is the, uh, the longest working uh, people. Uh, recently, Mexico, just a little few more hours uh, past Korea. Well, uh, it is true, and uh, it is one of the uh, very, very big and hot issue recently in Korea just to reduce the working hour to uh, um, make people's life uh, more balanced. But it is really tough, very tough. Recently, what uh, we see is to um, urge the private companies not to use um, text after working hour. So that is one very symbolic uh, gesture uh, to leave people uh, uh, stay home, stay uh, to their uh, personal life after the working hour is finished. Uh, more specifically, um, one reason why uh, Korea's working hour is, is the longest amongst uh, OECD, meaning probably the longest in the world, while the productivity is very low. One of the biggest reasons is that uh, uh, the productivity is of Korean service sector is really miserable. That is, that is the reason. Uh, when uh, uh, I say uh, service sector of Korea is mainly not just a fancy uh, luxury service. Mainly, it's a mom and pop uh, chicken sh uh, or, or fried chicken shop, or it's just a small uh, 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 shop of the village. So when a person at the age of 50s, 60s, when they retire, they accumulate all the, the uh, money they they saved, they invest it to a small. Uh, such kind of uh, uh, small uh, restaurants, and they are they are really poor in terms of productivity. Korean manufacture, manufacturing sector's productivity is almost 70 percent of the uh, United States level, which is very high. While the service sector uh, productivity is more or less 40, 50 percent of the uh, highest level. Uh, in the world. So that is uh, practically speaking one of the uh, major reasons. Of, of the uh, long uh, hours of uh, 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 labor while uh, low productivity. And the second question is also, in, in a way, um, I, I feel uh, guilty of that because Korea Foundation is the institute which is supposed to promote Korea in the world, including Sweden. So uh, K-pop, as you said, is just, well, Many Koreans, even Koreans, um, didn't expect K-pop would uh, uh, sustain uh, this long, say already uh, more than 10 years, I believe. Um, I'm not a big fan of K-pop. Well, first of all, I can't follow the speed. Um, but um, as, 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 the, as a representative of, of, of uh, so-called public diplomacy, Institute, what I would like to see is um, not only in Sweden, in Europe, in uh, South Asia, in most of the uh, world, including South America and Africa, there are uh, quite a large group of young people who are fascinated by K-pop somehow. I don't know the exact reason, but somehow. Um, what I would like to see is only a few percent of them probably would be interested in uh, knowing and learning a little more than the verse of a song 
or the, uh, of, of drama itself. So they tend to uh, go to a certain institute to learn about uh, Korean culture, what is Korean history, and then some of them are returning to the um, uh, doctorate degrees to study even deeper uh, things about Korea. So it is a, a type of uh, uh, ecosystem that is happening in North America. I believe it will be the case in Sweden also. So, uh, uh, well, if you say Korean embassy here is is full of lazy guys who, who don't do anything about promoting Korea, that's not the case. So, um, uh, we will try hard. Korea Foundation will support Korean embassy here to satisfy uh, those Swedish people who are ready to be interested in Korean things. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will work hard with K-pop and S-pop. S-pop is not a, a term yet, but Swedish music is, is what it is. <laughs> we have a question there. Yes, yes uh, my name is uh, Richard C. and uh, I'm a formerly one official. Uh, I, I am delighted to, to see that in this panel you, you have chosen to, uh, to treat the Nordic-Korea relations. Uh, I was expecting that uh, you will say Swedish Korea relations, but you have chosen Nordic, I think it's a very good idea. My con question concerns the peace process. Mm -hmm. In the Swedish media, uh, a lot is written the, for the, concerning the Swedish contribution uh, to, to the peace process uh, between the two Koreas. Uh, not a long time ago, we all know that the uh, foreign minister of North Korea visited Sweden. But uh, thereafter, people are a little bit astonished, or they wonder how, how it happened. Immediately afterward, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs visited Finland. So my question is, is there a Nordic position concerning the peace process uh, in, uh, between the two Korea? Well, I, I think in a way that question more belongs to the next uh, session, but, but we, we can... Uh perhaps comment and, and uh, answer on the aspect that is there a, a Nordic ana analysis of, of <coughs> what's happening in a, in a Nordic agreement on how to uh, tackle this? I don't know if Gay, do you want to start? Briefly, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the potential is there. and. Uh, as a Norwegian, I have to say that uh, the minister earlier on was in Oslo, just for your information. Um, but um, but I think that um, <laughs> we should we should take it up because this overemphasis on China from the Nordic perspective is uh, unhealthy, and uh, and Korea deserves. Uh, that we take much more attention, much more positive activities together to work uh, uh, for the better future for us all and including what the next panel will tell us but also in, in culture, in education and research uh, there are so many opportunities and uh, we, we should be able to work together. We have been fighting until 16 something and uh, after that we are uh, almost uh, a big family and let's use that thank you uh, yes please <coughs> uh, my name is Fabio Wittmann and I have missed uh, something maybe but no, no one mentioned about the Korean and diaspora the Koreans Korean. living in, in the diaspora there is a large amount of Koreans living in Sweden, for instance, adopted children from Korea. Do you think um, they are now grown-ups and they are quite a generation? Do you think there will be bridges of culture between Sweden and Korea? Because I remember the Korean government some years ago had a program to get the Koreans in the diaspora interested in Korea. And many adopted Korean children in Sweden go to Korea now to discover their roots, their families, 
some of them are writing books, etc. Do you think the center here will appeal to this category? There are around 10,000. It's not, it's, it's not so bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the, the, I think maybe I should answer that. Um, since uh, when I was working in Korea, uh, I had on several occasions the, the uh, opportunity to marry couples that came from Sweden, uh, adopted uh, couple, uh, couples that, that one party or, or both of them had been adopted and were now Swedes. And judging from their reaction, some of them uh, simply said, we came here because we wanted to somehow <coughs> have this uh, Korean uh, connection. And, and some others said, uh, when I came here, I realized I'm a Swede. So I think you will have no, not one answer to that question. You will have various answers. And I think that one thing can be said about the, the persons who were adopted into Swedish families they have done very well. Uh, they have integrated very well, and they are, are, are uh, uh, a part of society. And, and they have changed the Swedish view in many ways also, because now, <coughs> if you, if, as a Swede, if you see a person with an with a Asian-looking uh, face, you don't uh, usually, uh, maybe, maybe some do, but, but usually don't do the mistake of asking something in English. You, you take for granted that this person speaks Swedish. So, so integrated, I think, that ha have they been. And you can also see the, the, uh, the change of guards um, uh, outside the, the Swedish uh, palace, royal palace. Uh, you can see uh, Asian faces, uh, people of, of uh, Swedish African origin, and so forth. There, there's, the question should perhaps have been asked uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> I think now it's, it's, it really is uh, individuals that some, have, some of them have adapted well, some have adapted less well, and so forth. They're individual cases, I think. Gail, you had something to ask. I will arrest you. You used a wrong word. You said they are well integrated. You should have said assimilated. They're part of the Swedish population. The people of Sweden is also 10,000 Korean-born kids. And uh, the Danish, the, the Korean ambassador to Copenhagen, Denmark, called me some time ago and said, what, what can we do for the Korean kids here? And I asked him, who are you talking about? And he said, yeah, you know those Korean kids. I said, no, I don't know. Uh, do you mean business people working in Denmark with kids that go to national schools? No, 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 no. And he, he had a very difficult time to say they adopted. And I said, stay away from them. They are not Korean anymore. They are Danes. But if they address you, if they push the button, the clock in your door, you can say, what can I do for you? And you can do a lot. You can give them free travel to Korea and you can help them a lot. But don't ever go and say, what can I do for you? Because they have been tense. They just look at Sorry, but I might be controversial here, but this is a very strong point for me. Thank you very much. In order to avoid arrest, I will use the Trump, Trump technique of saying, I've never said that. <laughs> Yes, please. All right. Thank you very much for reminding uh, us of very important aspects. Uh, so we respect, you know, that aspect as well. And uh, we, uh, we think we, how can I say, we believe that you know, all Korean uh, adapted to the Swedish society, they are well assimilated. <laughs> and then uh, all, you know, actions, activities uh, by the embassy should be, uh, you know, based on volunteer, <laughs> volunteer basis. Uh, so uh, there is, you know, the association of, you know, Korean adopted here in Sweden, which you call you know, AKF. So if, if they wish, you know, we, uh, we have some, you know, uh, uh, something to do, and we, we have a regular relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And then we provide, uh, you know, uh, uh, in cooperation with the Korean community here, uh, the weekly, we have a weekly 
uh, from the school, you know, from the uh, you know, offspring of the you know, second generation of uh, uh, Korean you know, Those kind of things. You know, you know, you know. You know, there was, uh, 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 yes, uh, in the back, but okay, uh, lady here, yes, please. Um, my name is Elizabeth, I'm a Korean scientist and an author, and uh, I hope I'm not going to ask a question that is very touchy as a politically incorrect topic, but um, if you say Nordic Korea, it comes to my mind, or to other people, that there is a singular bond between these two areas, homogeneity. The people are, the culture is homogeneous. I mean, the Nordic uh, area is homogeneous, and also the Korean um, people. And in a world today, where everybody is talking about the benefits, and the glory of diversity, multiculturalism, and all that. It comes again to my mind, what was the singular factor that drove Korea, for example, into the prosperity and development that they are enjoying today? Like Korea, like Japan, or, or, or Germany, was raised to the ground after the Second World War. <coughs> But like a phoenix, it rose from the ashes and developed itself. And uh, some of my friends talk about it, especially when I came to Sweden as a young student. That, well, Sweden is very progressive, and they develop fast because the people are homogeneous. So um, uh, in a world today where everybody is talking about integration, diversity, and multiculturalism. Now, what is, uh, how can you set a parallel between the Nordic Korean relation to a world today that is just blushing under the, the glow of multicultural diversity policies? Thank you very much. Uh, very difficult in certain ways uh, question, a relevant question. You have one minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, Max Weber, a sociologist in Germany, said that East Asia can never develop because of Confucianism. When capitalism was introduced to East Asia plus Confucianism, it, the economy exploded. Was that within the time? Yes, yes, we, have, we still have 40 seconds. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the question is very interesting, but, but um, maybe researchers of today would have a slightly different view on the importance of the homogeneous um, societies in Sweden as well as in East Asia. I, I, I'm not a researcher, but I would very much uh, like to see more uh, on that topic, uh, because it, it might be that there are other questions actually, or, or other uh, things that have, have uh, affected it, it, it even more. Yes, please. Within time limits, you know, I always say the strong passion for the development of the people and leadership, first of all, and then uh, the wisdom to read the international situation, which was uh, the global globalization. And those two factors was the secret of success, in my view. Thank you. Uh, okay. I think, yes. unfortunately, we have to uh, draw a line here, and, and um, I would like to thank the panel, first of all, uh, for your comments and, and your uh, uh, commenting also on, on each other's comments. And I would like to thank uh, all of you for, for uh, listening and for asking very relevant questions. So we'll take a break, and then we'll come back for the next uh, So we, we hope you had a good coffee break and you come back refreshed for the second.
uh, panel discussion which will be on the subject of prospects for peace on the Korean Peninsula, which will be moderated by a distinguished fellow at ISTP and former ambassador, Per Ekman. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, different from the previous moderator, I have no personal experience of Korea. Uh, I have been ambassador to, to Georgia and prior to that ambassador to the Caribbean for the European Union. Uh, so uh, I'm, like you, looking forward to learn more about Korea and, of course, the prospects of peace on the Korean Peninsula. As we've heard previous uh, du uh, during this morning, uh, the situation on the uh, Korean Peninsula has seemingly dramatically changed from uh, peaking of tensions last year to a flurry of diplomacy and uh, a number of uh, activities. Uh, we had uh, the third inter-Korean summit in April 29th, and there is the prospect of a meeting between President Trump and the leader of North Korea. So things are definitely happening. Uh, of course, there are question marks. Hopefully, our panel will straighten out some of these question marks. Uh, and uh, we uh, are looking forward to their views and their experiences. And what a panel we have. Let me introduce them to you. First, I would like to introduce you uh, Dr. François Nicolas. Nicolas from the Institut Français des Relations Internationales. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> um, so, um, and, uh, she holds a doctorate degree and her research interests are emerging economists with a focus on East Asia. She is a director for the Center of Asian Studies. And she has been with the, I do it again, Institut Francais des Relations Internationales since 1990. Uh, we also have on the panel Dr. Mark Su from South Korea, who is a political scientist. Uh, he emphasized to me that he is now retired from his position in the Freie Universität at Berlin. However, aren't we all retired more or less? Well, I certainly am. So, welcome to the club. Still, you have a lot of experience in this because you have not only been researcher and Korean coordinator at the Free University of Berlin, but also a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on Peaceful and Democratic Unification of Korea. Last but not least, we have Dr. Swanstrom, uh, Swanstrom, should we say? Um, who is the executive director of ISDP and a frequent traveler to North and South Korea, uh, who has a doctorate degree from Uppsala University of Peace and Conflict Resolution. Um, so, that's the panel. The Why has the situation seemingly changed so quickly from the, the uh, bellicose situation we felt we had in, at, at the end of 2017 to what we see today. What has brought North Korea to the negotiating table? How important has President Moon been in driving forward this process of rapprochement? Who would like to start? with one remark. Uh, as an economist by training, I'm always being criticized for not being able to forecast the future. Economists are very good at forecasting the past. Uh, the future is more tricky. And so we're always criticized for, for that. And for once, we're quite happy that political scientists are as bad as we are. Because I guess that nobody would have guessed back in uh, December 2017 that the situation would have changed at least to that extent 
on the Korean Peninsula. So your, uh, your question is a very good question. Why have things changed? Nobody knew, nobody anticipated this change. My response to this question, it's a very tricky, and uh, I guess the, the, the answer could be extremely long, and I don't want to steal all the time. My response to this question is that there's not one single explanation, as usual, by the way. An event is not never the result of one single cause or one single reason. So it's a multi-factor uh, explanation. My guess, uh, my take on this, and I know that uh, some other panelists will disagree on that, uh, I think that the sanctions actually played some kind of a role. So my interpretation is that sanctions started to bite. And so there was perhaps some uh, rising pressure on the North Korean uh, leadership to do something, to take a move, to, yeah, to move in one, one direction. Combined with that is also the uh, pressure exerted by President Trump. Uh, I think this pressure also played some kind of a role. None of these explanations in isolation would do the trick, but the combination of them probably did the trick. But I think that the, the pressure exerted by Trump also play, played a role. The, the unpredictability on the part of President Trump is a key factor. With this, with this guy, you can never know. And so if you don't know, perhaps the best thing is to be a little bit careful. And so that's another element, uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, what, uh, what else can I, can I say? Um, well, these are two major, major factors, uh, I guess. And of course, since part of the question um, referred to uh, uh, President Moon, I think President Moon's role was also quite, quite important. Uh, Kim Jong-un saw that there was somebody in the Blue House who was willing to act differently compared to the past two uh, leaders, and so it was also probably perceived as an opportunity. So I would highlight these three, three factors, but I insist on that in combination. One single factor in isolation couldn't really lead to the, the change in the future. But I, I guess that it would be extremely important. Thank you very much. Dr. Su, would you like to add something to this comment? Yes. Thank you very much. And actually, I wish to thank Nicholas and then I did ASDP for inviting me to this important event. And then I'm actually overseas Korea, living in actually the US first and then Germany since the last 46 years. So, but I'm one of the very fortunate Koreans because I can visit North Korea and South Korea both without having any political difficulties. That's one of the advantages I've been having since 2001 when I went to North Korea for the first time. But since about 30 visits to, I made in North Korea, I realized that North Korea is a completely different country than we expect and we know. And we have a completely different vision of expect something different from North Korea without knowing it. That's why I believe explain something why North Korea all of a sudden changed. But it didn't change, it didn't come about very quickly. It took a long process, more than a year. But the important factor, I think Francois mentioned a few facts, but uh, I would add a few more. Most important thing is something happened in South Korea last year. In May, new president was elected for five year, one term period. And then the president elected uh, Moon Jae-in is a, is a son of a refugee family. His parents are from North Korea. So the, Moon Jae-in was a human rights lawyer and then had to, he worked for human rights situation in South Korea and then actually he was very close associate of former president Moon Jae-in. And then he tried to improve the situation in Korea at that time already. But the failure to think about changes at that time because certain things simply, simply didn't work out. But this time was different. He wanted to have a basic, actually, solution to the problem. So important thing is, okay, when he was elected in May 2017, he was invited to the G20 meeting in Hamburg last year. And then on his, in the July, on his way to the Hamburg G20, he paid an official visit to Germany. And he came to Berlin, 
and he delivered a very long speech, 70 minute speech, which was basically actually delivered to, for the actual signal to North Korea. And this speech was registered in North Korea very clearly, and they issued and they studied whether this speech is serious or something. But the, the promises he made in Berlin is very clear. First thing he said, there is no more regime change, which is 180% of the previous government in South Korea. He said, no more regime change we will see for North Korea. And then second, which is very important the disputed I mean, question in South Korea, no more early unification policy. That means unification will be postponed a little, a little bit, but peace first. And then third issue also, which was actually, actually uh, delivered, actually aimed at China was there will be no block building between the U.S., China, and South Korea against North Korea. And that was in order to comfort China. But that signal was registered in North Korea. And then I remember I went to North Korea in October last year. And then they kept on, I spent about a week in Pyongyang. And they kept on asking me whether, one question is whether North Korea actually, I mean, it takes the proposal from South Korea seriously, but whether South Korea President Moon Jae-in will be able to deliver their promises even if the U.S. rejects it, as the previous government. So I told them, okay, this time Moon Jae-in is different than the previous government because he's from the North Korea, and he actually grew up in a refugee camp in South Korea. He knows the misery of uh, the wartime I mean, actual situation. That's why he wants to prevent war, any conflict in Korea, because he was shot I mean, during the uh, verbal exchanges between Kim Jong-un and then Trump that the war will take, over, take place in South Korea without even Koreans knowing about it. That's why he, he thought he would be active to prevent any military conflict in Korea. That was a signal, and then North Koreans registered that, okay, good occasion is to deal with South Korea directly, because until that time, was North Korean position was everything decided in Washington. South Korea has nothing to say, because they, they consider South Korea as a colony of the U.S and occupied by the U.S. forces. That's why they thought only to deal with Washington is the first way to solve the problem. But now they changed the situation. They thought, okay, Moon Jae-in, new president in South Korea, is a different compared to previous one. That's why they took his offer seriously and then actually decided to use the Winter Olympic in Pyeongchang. That's why he sent uh, his sister, younger sister, who also was brought up in, in Switzerland together, so very close to, to him, and uh, that's why he sent the highest delegation to South Korea during the Pension Olympics. And that was the beginning, actually. Actually, North Korea and South Korea together, trying to build first, because they thought, realized, both Korea realized that war can take place in South Korea or in whole Korea without even Koreans knowing about it, mainly because of the conflict between the U.S. and China. That's why Koreans decided, okay, we should do something before it's too late. And that's the starting point. And then, actually, what they agreed in Panmunjom is also very important. Panmunjom, they agreed, okay, the warlike situation, I will say, tell you one thing also. In South Korea, people don't think about Korean War. They think it's a history. It's a long gun. It's a, Terrible war took place in Korea, but was already over because of the U.S. is protecting. But in North Korea, it's the opposite. 25 million North Koreans are living in a more like warlike situation. Every day, they have to turn off the light at 10 o'clock, and then they are afraid that U.S. bombers will come and then bomb the country again. That's why they are living in a warlike situation since 1953. They signed on the truce agreement. That means they will stop temporarily fighting, but uh, the peace solution is not clear yet. That's why North Koreans are living in a warlike situation. A, I, I see it as a garrison state. Everything is controlled by the military. People cannot move around. If they want to go to one town to another, they have to get permission. And they are not allowed to meet South Koreans because it's are enemies. So he said, North Koreans are, in a way, they are, it's a hostage of their own system. That's why. The first step to change the situation, I think, is 
very good solution that North and South Korea decided, okay, termination of Korean War will take place on 27th of July this year. That's a sixth, fifth anniversary of signing the truce agreement. But the fact that South and North Korea never signed truce agreement, that's why many people watch that North and South Koreans are technically at war, but it's not technically, it's a real war because the North Koreans and South Koreans are willing to fight any moment. But North Koreans will never invade because they know if they shoot first, then China and the Russians will not protect them. That's why Chinese and the Russians will keep on telling them, if you are invading, we'll protect you. But if you shoot first and attack South Koreans or US, then we'll not protect you. That's the one of the guarantee. That's why often I'm, I'm very optimistic that there will be no war in Korea because each side, they have two cautious. They are hoping that other side enemies will make a mistake, but they don't want to start with trouble. But in fact, the U.S. also realized that if U.S. used the military forces, China and the North, uh, Russia will protect North Korea. That will be beginning of a third world war. So nobody wants to have a big, big war in North Korea. But uh, anyway, they, the situation is that this process is a long process. Actually, if things move on as scheduled or as, as planned, the U.S. and North Korean summit will take place in Singapore on July, on the June 12th. But uh, that meeting, uh, expecting that maybe termination of the Korean War, North Korea, U.S. and North Korea will decide, okay, Korean War is over, we'll just recognize North Korea as a sovereign state, and then diplomatic relations will be normalized and the things will move. And then if situation actually successfully ended, then China and then South Korea might join and the four powers might sign a peace treaty or something, but still it's open. I mean, the, the reason why they decided uh, Singapore was North Korea and the US had embassy in Singapore and then also because of the actually interest all over the world, maybe 3,000 even more journalists will be gathering. So infrastructure is most developed in Singapore. So I think I will stop here and then let you go for you. Yeah, I, I, I can see that <laughs> that, that uh, Niklas Sonström is eager to uh, <laughs> grab the microphone. So, <laughs> no, uh, well, I just come back to the question, and actually, the uh, when we talk about pressure and sanctions, I, I differentiate between those two because I think the, the pressure has been very effective on, on North Korea. And, uh, Already in the end of last year, the North Koreans sort of said that the predictability of Donald Trump was a problem, a challenge. However, the economic sanctions, I disagree that they have been very effective up to date. Um, especially, we see, of course, that the, the, the gas prices has gone up a bit. But consumer goods in shops and all that are still there. Um, and it's not a radical change. Of course, the countryside is different. The sanctions hit much more there. But let's be honest, the government is less concerned about that. But I think the political pressure was essential. But then there's one thing that comes in is it's timing as well. I mean, the, uh, what Mark was saying about uh, the situation on the South Korean side, I, I definitely agree on all that. Uh, but it was also one major thing that happened it was that North Korea declared itself a nuclear power. It had the confidence of being a nuclear power, which enabled them to utilize rules. <coughs> it was the first time North Korea as a state can engage in, in a discussion as they perceive as equals. And this is actually something that comes back all the time, that the North Korea now see themselves as equal to the United States and South Korea. Actually, not to South Korea, but to the United States. Um, and that's just essential, because that's enabled them to join the Olympic Games. They can also back out all the time. But that also puts up a bit of skepticism. If the nuclear weapons were the trigger that allowed them to get into negotiations, why would they give them up without security guarantees and far-reaching? So when we look at Marcus already now coming into the Singapore meeting, it's absolutely essential what the Americans are willing to do on the compromising side, uh, because there's 
really no reason for the North Koreans to give up the nuclear weapons unless they have security guarantees. And I think that will be, of course, the, the major challenge. And even today, I mean, I, I just came back from North Korea 10 days ago. It was interesting, two things. The anti-American posters are still in Pyongyang. You can see them on street corners and everything, the nuclear bombs hitting Washington. Uh, but also, they took us to the wall. The, the wall that the South Koreans built to defend against the, uh, uh, against North Koreans. So they still have that siege mentality. They still have that fear of the um, uh, United States and, and uh, well, the United States. So the question I sort of raise now is, how much is Trump willing to go? And uh, is it an all or nothing deal, or is he, will he be willing to compromise? Well, I think that is uh, a, uh, a question that we could that you could speculate on separately. I mean, uh, how far is the U.S. going to go? How far is the North Korea willing to go? Is there any seriousness behind the declaration from the summit in April about? denuclearization, what are the pitfalls, what are the obstacles, uh, what, what kind of, of game can you see coming up here, because a number of agreements have been reached before uh, and uh, they haven't been fulfilled. What's different now? What's really in it for, for North Korea and, uh, to give it up? Well, I, I guess that one, one key factor that was highlighted by Nicholas is the fact that North Korea is now, perhaps not de jure, but de facto, a nuclear power. And it's being recognized as such. And so it makes a big, big difference, uh, I think, at least from, from their, their point of view. So, uh, so they, prom they pro promise to denuclearize. What does that mean? Uh, if I understand properly, they promise to uh, dismantle one of the sites, but as far as I understand, I'm not a techni technician in this kind of issues, but what I understand, uh, well, this site was no longer usable uh, anyway, so they would have to get rid of it anyway. So th this promise is not as strong a promise as it may look. That's one fir first thing. Then, uh, does denuclearization also mean complete denuclearization of the peninsula, in which case that would mean that the U.S. had to withdraw. I'm not sure that the U.S. <laughs> interpret denuclearization in the, in the same way. So I think that there are a number of things that still need to be uh, defined during the, the meeting, and I'm afraid that, that during this meeting we will realize that there are huge definition gaps, which is something that happens quite, quite often. But so we, we may, or we may, they may agree on, well, in theory, or in principle, on various words, but they don't mean exactly the same thing with the same words. And so when it gets to the details, or well, the devil is in the details, as we always say, and so we'll, fi we'll find out that the, uh, the materialization of the promise and the materialization of the agreement would be much more complicated than initially expected or anticipated. So uh, that's why I personally am pretty skeptical about what can be obtained, what can be achieved during this, uh, this meeting. And there is a real risk that actually nothing is achieved and that there is some kind of uh, dead, uh, deadlock at the end of this, uh, of this meeting. But I may be too, uh, too pessimistic or uh, being a French person, I'm skeptical by nature. So, <laughs> that may be why. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, we agree to disagree. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, important things are difference with the previous <clears throat> agreements and something. There are two important factors. Big difference between North and South Korean agreements are actually South Korean government is now willing to accept North Korea. That was the big problem in previous government because previous government expected that North Korean regime will collapse within 10 years. When Kim Il-sung died, many expected that within three, years, three days, North Korean regime will collapse. 
But uh, even when Kim Jong Il took over in 1998, U.S. and many South Korean observers expected within 10 years the regime will collapse. That's why South Koreans promised everything to deal with North Korea, but refused to help North Korea because expected, okay, we'll wait until they collapse. That was a missed opportunity. But this time, learned from the past, okay, only wasting time to expect that North Korea to collapse and doing everything to actually to sanction and isolation with about North Korean collapse is an illusion. I don't think the North Korean regime, regime is so built up that it cannot collapse. And for example, 94, when Kim Il-sung died, there was economic collapse. So two, three million people died, but the regime survived. But that situation will not repeat again in North Korea. Now people, people learn how to survive. That's why they, even if the economic collapse will come, which is unlikely, the regime will never collapse. That's why I think it's a wise decision that the uh, Mujahideen government learned from the past. Was, instead of just pushing North Korea to be isolated and to, to collapse, it just deal with North Korea and then change the situation in North Korea so people will be free from this whole that situation. I think it's very wise. So it will take some time. Because the peace process is a long process. I think first now North and South Korea has to terminate the Korean War. Instead of signing the truce agreement, they will declare, okay, war is over. There should be no more war in Korea, period. And then try to find a peace agreement or a treaty with the US and China supporting it. And that will, in a way, help to establish permanent sustainable peace in Korea. And then actually, the big challenge to North Koreans, I think, even, even more so in South Korea, because uh, thinking has really changed in South Korea as well. Expecting North Korea to collapse, or the communists with the horns on their head, I mean, it has to be actually dead North Koreans are best North Koreans or something. But it has to change. The North Koreans are a different country. It's changed a lot. And I've been watching, I mean, each time I go there, I was expecting that because of the sanctions, people will suffer. But I didn't see any suffering, actually, of economic trouble, because each time when I visit a shopping mall or something, I see now less Chinese products because of the sanctions. They cannot import Chinese products. So now they have their own products. That's why North Korean, in a way, economy is booming at the moment, about 4, 4 or 5 percent. So situation is improved. And then I think uh, Kim Jong-un became a very popular since 1915, because he proved that he's tough as his grandfather, then they don't have his father. But uh, they see him as a reincarnation of his great, great, great grandfather, Kim Il-sung. That's why they are expecting a lot from him, and they think that he's able to manage actually the uh, Trump and then get what they want, what they need. That's why he's, uh, he's showing that I mean, the way he's treated by Xi Jinping with China, and then also with uh, Hu Jae-in. So in, in domestically, he is, in a way, very solid situation. He will not collapse or he will be challenged by military or anything. I was afraid that military will be the main user if there is any change is coming. That's why I was afraid that maybe he will be killed by the military before the summit in, in Kassel. But uh, literally nothing happened, so I think certainly he's a big challenge how he managed because his Actually, danger for the regime is not the U.S. or South Korea invading North Korea. He knows that there will be no war. But he's afraid of his own people. Because he's been keeping the people, 25 million people, just like a slave for 25 years. But the weather will continue, nobody knows. And how to change to new situation and then how to tell his people. Because North Koreans are told that, okay, pretty soon, unification will come. That means the revolution will take place in South Korea and then Americans will be pushed out. And then the riches and everything in South Korea will be North Koreans. That's why North Koreans are assigned already. Who will be the mayor of Seoul? Who will be the political commissioner? Everything is already. Whole society is actually planned for the unification in their own terms. And that will be a big challenge for the future. I mean, in general. So, yeah. Niklas. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think we're going to be reading after the summit meeting uh, on Twitter. 
that this has been the best agreement ever. The best, the best, the best. Uh, so I think per definition there will be an agreement. Um, the problem of course is the content. And uh, the Iran deal, or the, the scrapping of the Iran deal is going to make this complicated. Because it really has to be better than anything Obama has done. And I think that's the the benchmark. But the problem is that the United States, of course, has demanded denuclearization, total and verifiable denuclearization. Then as it comes to, is it global? Is it regional? Is it local? Uh, what is interesting, though, is that the North Koreans are not strictly interested in lifting of the sanctions, which is also a thing that they probably have six to 12 months before they have really serious problems in the economy. But what they're looking for is normalization and peace agreement. And I think that's brilliant from Kim because that actually, if you normalize relations, if you have a peace agreement, the sanctions will be lifted anyway. I mean, that's a natural, especially for the South Korean, Chinese, and Russian side. But the problem I see is really how do you sell it domestically for all three? This is um, President Moon has its own challenges domestically, selling this as an agreement that leads to a change, a long-lasting peace. Donald Trump has to sell this domestically as total denuclearization. Denuclearization is verifiable, immediate de de denuclearization, as you said. And Kim actually probably has the, the easier way to sell it, in the sense that if he can show his population this is verifiable, that he creates economic development, uh, he can also sell it domestically. But the thing is, he has to offer something. And uh, for me, it's the logical solution would be a step-by-step -step approach, where we say we have denuclearization over time. That can be 2020 is a good year, which we can aim for. Even that is extremely fast. Because even if the best of agreements, let's say Kim Jong-un, agrees to total denuclearization today, it takes years to dismantle every single infrastructure regarding this. Then we have human capital. We have scientists. How do you isolate them? So the thing is, it's the, the, the that immediate denuclearization is well, cannot be so immediate. <laughs> it's a myth, exactly. So, so the question is really how much willing. And I think when you look at administration, I think they are willing to compromise uh, and trying to find a way to sequence this. But I'm not sure Donald Trump has that, and that's the big unknown. But I think the North Koreans now. I'm sort of optimistic here, would be willing to engage in a denuclearization process over time. Um, then it's a question, will it take one year, five years? That's of course something that I, it's impossible to, to sort of say. But security, normalization, it's absolutely essential. And if you live in North Korea and you have the North Korean psyche that the Americans are out there to get you, Everything they do in Asia is directed toward North Korea. Why would they give up the nuclear weapons immediately? And that's something we need to get into and, and, and try to engage them and engage them over time. So for me, yeah, I'm, I'm positive in the sense that I think this would be very useful, but also I'm skeptical of the timeline. It's, I think it's maybe too much to ask for an immediate denuclearization. On the other hand, we have two leaders who are, both when you speak to Americans and North Koreans, they all say that all the decisions regarding this process is taken by the top leaders. And when we, we talk about the top leaders, we're talking about a handful of leaders. Um, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump is used to taking quick decisions, rather surprising decisions. So if any two leaders would be able to do this, I think these could be the ones. On the other hand, it can either be great success or it can be great failure. I mean, it has to risk here. And I'm not going to actually, I don't think Kim Jong-un is normally the great unknown. I think Donald Trump is the great unknown. So.
Oh, let it be. Well, you were talking about the, the prospect of a long, long process, a step-by-step -step approach in, in, this, in this process. But patience is not what Donald Trump is known for. <laughs> so uh, how can you consolidate that? Oh, patience is not what the Koreans are known for either. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I think it's it, it, in a best, no, I think it, this is the challenge that Donald Trump needs an immediate success. So he needs an agreement that is better than the Iran deal, and that's faster, it's verifiable, it's uh, unconditional. But nevertheless, it needs to be, I mean, this is the, the problem I see. So the thing is, is I think you need people like Mattis and others go in and say, oh, listen, sorry, this is a long process. Yes, we can remove the nuclear weapons, but we can't remove the everything overnight. And Bolton has already proposed the, um, the Libyan model to fly in, pick up the nuclear weapons, and leave. Well, that hasn't really solved the issue. Either. You can easily hide nuclear weapons and everything. But um, but a good part is that when the Koreans decide to do things, they go, it goes really fast. And I think we've seen that with the summit meeting now between uh, Chairman Kim and President Moon. It's just all the meetings that happen goes really, really fast. So, yeah, it, is, it wouldn't work with the Swedes, but it might actually <laughs> work with the... Uh, it works better with the Koreans, this innovation. No, we, we will probably set up a... a, a a uh, committee <laughs> with a two-year time frame and come up with something which will wash you at the end. Uh, when, uh, Mr. Su, when you mentioned collapse is out of the, of, of the question, I mean, very few foresaw the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, and, and, but it, it has happened in any case. So why, why, why would you ex exclude the collapse of the Korean Peninsula? Okay. North Korea is not a normal country. Things, everything well, is... People would argue Soviet Union was neither. Yeah, but it's not a military state. Soviet Union, actually North Korea was actually a satellite state of a Stalinist, typical Soviet type, yeah, communist country. But it, it became a personal state, Kim Il-sung, more like it's a old Korean kingdom. And then it's controlled by military, so it cannot change. I mean, even if... The Kim Jong Un is killed, but something happened, then someone else will take over from Kim family, and there are many candidates. Like the Kim Jong Il is a half-brother <coughs> of the Kim Jong Il, and other. So there are many potential successes. And so actually, without changing the current situation, that is a warlike situation. Everything is on alert. People cannot even. I am foreigner, so I'm much more freer than North Koreans. For example, when I visit them now. After 10 o'clock, nobody is allowed to go out. But I mean, as a foreigner, as a guest of the country, a government, I'm allowed to. So when North Korean guys or the party people escorting me and then looking after me until I leave, they ask me, okay, please, look, I mean, take me to a certain place because we have to do something. And then if I sit there, I don't have to talk, but if I sit in the car, with a number, special number. I have a free pass. So that means I'm free, because if I say what I want to see in North Korea, certain places, I can visit. But North Koreans cannot do that. So it's a very strictly controlled, because people, more than three people, cannot gather together. So it's, they have to get permission. So it's current situation in North Korea, who is any kind of changes. Although there are markets everywhere, whole country, I visit every part of the country, and then I see expansion of the marketplaces everywhere. So things are changing without government allowing it. They, they say no, but still people do it. They have to earn money to survive. So it's, it's actually a big challenge to operate to the the regime, how to accommodate with these new political changes. If really U.S. decide to accept North Korea as a normal state and establish embassy, then they have to at least change the whole situation. There should be no more war, or no more alert. Because at 10 o'clock, you have to turn off the light. Certain, they don't have electricity. But they say, oh, because of the 
may be a possible air attack by the U.S. forces. They have to turn off the light. If you keep on light, you will be punished. Continue. Yeah, every day. That goes on every day since 1953. So it's a war is real life in North Korea. So without changing the basic system, that's what I think. Mujahideen government is very clever. Okay, sign a peace treaty between North and South Korea. At least declare that Korean War is over. Terminate Korean War without even signing the truce agreement is a first step. And then ask U.S. and China to support it by signing peace treaty, recognizing North Korea. Actually, South Korea recognized China in 1992, and Chinese position at that time was close recognition. The U.S. should recognize North Korea at the same time, but the U.S. refused to do that. That's why only the China recognized South Korea. That's why you know that economic relations between China and North South Korea is, is very important at the moment. But the U.S. failed at that time to recognize North Korea, although North Korea began to change at that time to accommodate or change its demands from the U.S. and South Korea But uh, that's, that's the past. Uh, we I mean, always blame North Korea for not keeping their promises, but it's not true. Only that's half of the truth. Because also the U.S. side did not keep the promise because they expected that North Korean regime will collapse yeah, sooner or later. But I mean, at the moment, I think, uh, instead of expecting that, uh, wasting time expecting that North Korea to collapse, it's too dangerous. If it's collapsed, right? what can you do? You cannot go in there. South Korea is not regarded as enemy. They will kill it. That's why instead of just being able to at least exchange in, in every level, and then now expecting to collapse is too dangerous. And that's, I think that it shows that 94 and then until 98, North Korea was collapsed, I and mean, economic, all the distribution system collapsed. That's why people died. And then outside world, even South Korea couldn't do anything, just blame that, okay, the regime has failed, and that people started to death. But I think that's partially South Korean also responsibility, because when North Korea came down, prime minister level with the two Koreas in 91 and 92, North Korean, Yan Yan Mu, North Korean prime minister, practically kneel down at the Blue House. Uh, the who was president at that time, was close to the end of his office. And he begged, because Soviet Union was about to disappear. That's why North Korean leader Kim Il-sung knew that without help from South Korea, they cannot survive. That's why Yan Yan Mu actually begged for help. But the, this demand from North Korea was completely misjudged, misinterpreted. And then Mote I mean, discussion with the, all the staffs, decided not to help North Korea because if they help South North Korea, the unification will be delayed because North Korean regime will not collapse. That's why they decided, okay, sending Yen and Mook empty-handed will bring about unification fast. And that's why, but the, as a result, nuclear issue came up and then the whole situation changed. Actually, confrontation and the nuclear problem started from that because of the South Korean actually wrong decision. Instead of helping and going into North Korea, then we have saved that we could have saved three million people. They would not I mean, die of starvation. But actually, wrong assumption that uh, collapse will come down and will come soon because of the economic situation was a completely wrong. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 20 minutes to go. Uh, Maybe we should open up the floor for questions and comments. So, could I get some help with the microphone, please? Uh, thank you for your discussion. Um, I was in Prague in 91 and I worked on a technology project because one of the important things with peace is okay, what's going to happen to the economy? And it won't happen overnight. So in Europe, we've had three different paradigms what happened with the Marshall Plan, we've got what happened with Russia and Ukraine. 
and then we've got what happened with countries like East Germany, for example, and Prague, you know, Czech Republic. So what economic policy would best help this transition to <coughs> peaceful change? Well, that's a, that's a, a, a tri tricky question. But well, for, first thing about the yeah, e economics, uh, I think that, and that's precisely why uh, I still remain convinced that you know, sanctions started to buy blah, blah, blah. The reason why I'm saying that is precisely, officially, in North Korea, Kim Jong-un uh, imposed this dual strategy of development of nuclear armament and at the same time economic development. That was the official line. The reality was slightly different. He did quite well on the first part, <laughs> on nuclear development. On economic development he didn't do as well. Okay? And so that's why I think that over time he realized, and precisely for the, for the reasons that you highlighted, since the major risk or major challenge comes from his own people, what he wanted was to shift towards economic development because he realized that he had to do that to please people to some extent. He could no longer just you know, maintain a very tight grip on the people. He had to well, achieve something or offer something to the, to the, the people. So, uh, so, so much for economic development as, as seen from North Korea. So I think that it, it is part of the strategy now. So what they want is to push economic development to some, to some extent. How can we help in that? That's not really easy. Uh, but I guess one way is through the uh, <coughs> development or uh, assistance provided to special economic zones, for instance. This is something that has been tried to some extent in North Korea, but with very few uh, results or very few, very little success uh, so far. And the reason was that the special economic zones were actually not real special economic zones. Uh, there was the special case of Kaesong, which was more a political thing than real, real special economic zone as defined in, in China, for instance. Then you had another zone which turned out to be a casino zone. So there was also something totally uh, not in line with them. Uh, traditional economic zones. Then you had another third zone that could have been, that could have evolved into something looking more like the Chinese special economic zones. But for the time being, it has not been a, a big success. So that, would, that could be one, one, uh, one, one way. And of course, in the development of these zones, what they need are foreign investors. And so this is where, I guess, foreign countries could, could contribute through for, yeah, providing foreign investment. Well, that, would, that could be a, a way, and that would help turn the economy, well, first of all, achieve economic development, and it would also help turn the economy gradually into something more like a market economy. I agree that there is, there are elements of a market economy, but at the local level, and at, at a very uh, small, small level, so, so to speak. And the point here would be to turn the whole economy into a market economy. So what, one, what I would suggest is really push or uh, support the uh, development of such uh, economic zones through foreign investment. Thank you. Or we take the next question. Thank you for the panel. I am calling you. I would like to answer a question to Mark. And um, now um, Trump and Kim are going to meet. If they fail, what should North and South Korea do? Sure. Yeah. So if they fail. Oh, <laughs> I hope not, but I mean, <laughs> I hope not, but at least if. Okay. <clears throat> If they fail to reach an agreement, then we have to live with nuclear North Korea. That's the fact. You cannot disappear, I mean, destroy North Korea all night and then get rid of the nuclear weapons. That means we have to accept the reality that North Korea is a nuclear power, just like China and Russia, or Pakistan and India. And then it will be very tough for South Korea to accept that. But uh, that's, that will be the reality. That's what South Korea is pushing 
very strongly at the moment, persuading North Korea. Without giving up the North nuclear options, the U.S. will never accept it. That's why it's actually the whole nuclear issue is uh, based, basically persuasion of South Korea. That's why South Korea is doing at the moment everything to persuade North Korea to do something. But I'm a little bit afraid that U.S. is pushing too much because U.S. is not only planning to take out all the bombs at the moment present in North Korea, but also nuclear physicists, all the scientists who are developing nuclear weapons, they want to take them in third country. But it would not be that easy. Yeah, because there are about 4,500 nuclear physicists in North Korea. Now, what, what can you do? I mean, North Korea, U.S. planning to train them, retrain in the, the Young Gun Science Center, but I don't think that will work. It will take a long, long time. But uh, in some way, I'm afraid that U.S. is pushing too much and expecting too easy, because it's a complicated issue. It's not that simple that I mean, okay, a few scientists, maybe 100, 150 scientists, should be out. Who knows how to make nuclear bombs? So, but uh, it's not that easy. And then, actually, the taking out the actual bombs, you never know how many they have, then they will never fail. And they said, North Korea is, I mean, whole country is uh, like a military base. Everything is underground. They've been preparing since 1950, during the war, and then continue, continue, I mean, because they think the U.S. will return any time. <coughs> they, they claim that the Korean War was started by the U.S., which is, I mean, telling to their own people. That's why they say, yeah, the U.S. will come back any time to, to restart the Korean War. But, uh, okay, one, one issue, because the uh, Francois mentioned about sanctions and the work on that, but I, I, I was surprised to see that sanction somewhere. I didn't notice any differences in North Korea because there are people, I mean, many different parts in the countryside, or in they tell me that, okay, they are used to sanctions. I mean, the sanction is nothing new. So they've been doing it the last 60 years, so they know how to get, a, get away from it. And then I said, what do you miss the most through sanction? I said, okay, medicine. They cannot get medicine. So in North Korea, you shouldn't get sick. Otherwise, because you don't have medicine, then you're likely to die. That's why they said sanctions certainly hurt normal people. But normal people have nothing to say. And then there was an interesting guy, I asked him, one beer, the American student who was in prison and then released, and then he died in the US after return. And they said that's because of the sanction. That he couldn't be treated correctly by, by medicine because he, he ate something. I, I, Ask them whether they tortured him. I said, ne never. They treated him very nicely. But some way, he ate something or something kind of allergic or some kind of problem. But they, they used no medicine. And then the situation got worse, so they released him. And then both of them were telling me, he was intentionally let him die, let him treat him, in order to blame North Korea. But I don't know whether they're true or not. But actually, that's the situation that North Korea believe that because of sanction, Normal people are hurting. That's certainly, but uh, that would have missed the chief. A number of more questions. The lady on the second row. Thank you. Uh, there are other parties involved in this treaty. Um, if one reflects over what has happened recently with the trade war, coming soon between China and the U.S. and uh, the sanctions on Russia, another party. The Japanese have been very marginalized in this uh, issue. Do you think they will really make it easy for Mr. Trump to sign any deal without any consequences? I mean, the Chinese are taking any opportunity now to show who is leading this part of the world. And this is an ideal, ideal situation where they can uh, maybe put the brakes. And um, uh, if you can elaborate on the other parties involved in this treaty. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that we should give that question also to, to Niklas, for example. And if you start, then we have Mr. Sue. Well, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, actually, the one of these agreements, of peace agreements, would actually be in favor of China. China has been the big loser up to now. 
And what we see today is that um, China's role has increased significantly. And with the peace treaty, the Chinese would suddenly use this and say, well, why are you still in RK? This is no longer an issue between the United States and North Korea. This is obviously a, a directed toward China. So for China, the resolution of this could actually be in their benefit and a continuation. So the Chinese are happy to see this evolve. Um, more tension would be more problematic for China. That forces South Korea closer to the United States. And that's definitely something that would not be useful. But then, Japan is, is virtually isolated as well. And, and that's, but our disposition is, is not, unfortunately, not very strong, and unfortunately not for Japanese. He has pressured the, Donald Trump to lift up the abduction issue. And Donald has promised to do so. If he will do that or not, I think it depends on his mood. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. And it's not the priority for the United States. It's not the priority for South Korea. It's not the priority for China. So the Japanese are increasingly isolated. And unfortunately, I would say the North Koreans view the Japanese very much as they view the South Koreans before as a bank. These are the guys that can invest in, in North Korea. Um, so, I think this is definitely something that uh, the Chinese support, the Japanese are still trying to figure out their role. And they need to change their policy. And I think we're going to see a change of the uh, Abbas policy towards North Korea, which is much more engagement and much more active policy. So I, I think we, yeah, I think we're going to definitely see a more independent Japanese policy, simply because they're isolated. They're forcing them out. Thank you very much. Uh, another question? Yeah. Third row, oh, another lady. Uh, I'm Sufi Chen Aksasong. Uh, I'm a journalist and I also study international politics. And uh, I thanks for the SCP to discuss this issue and uh, commend all the panelists that really give a wonderful, wonderful uh, speech and wonderful answer. Uh, I'd like to give some comments uh, about the solutions uh, for this issue. I think in the West we should not forget there was a very ancient wisdom. Uh, once uh, there was a gamble, so, so God said, uh, God or, or the devil, they gamble with a person, he said, uh, uh, the wind, the wind and the sun has this uh, gamble. So the wind said, okay, I will force this person to take off his clothes. So he blows, blow, uh, blowing so strong, but the, the person just uh, take the clothes very tight to himself. And then the sun said, I will make him easily take off the clothes. So he smile, the sun smile, and the very warm, become very, very warm. So then this man easily take off the clothes. And I remember in the Korean peninsula, uh, peninsula there was once, uh, there was sunlight policy. I don't know if it's uh, relevant, but I think if we, we uh, implement uh, the sunlight policy towards North Korea, Kim Jong-un is not a stupid man. He is very clever and he's stable, because he's born in January. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's not stable, it's not because he doesn't want to be stable. Because he, he's not capable to control the outside force and pressure. So when he cannot uh, fulfill or live, live up to your expectation, then you think he get a lie. But it's not his lying because he cannot reach. And so I think the, the, the only uh, solution now is to be, to recognize him, what he wants, both domestic and outside. He just wants recognition. And if he has uh, recognition from the United States and Western countries, 
then it would be great for his domestic politics too. So I think that's the only way for the future. And I, I fully agree with Francois about this, uh, you know, economic zone or investing, whatever, with Japanese, South Korea, China. North Korea is small, it's not a very big country. So instead of putting FAD or missile or other ballistic weapons, you just have a couple of these weapons, money, you will rescue North Korea. Okay, so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one more intervention from the floor. <laughs> Good night. How, how do we do this? This gentleman has been raising his hand for quite some time. Okay. My name is Gunnar Beck, and I've been traveling quite a lot uh, in North Korea since 2000. Uh, uh, when we talk about China, everybody seems to see that they are just a spectator and, and hoping that it goes that way. But what do we know about what influence do they have? What guarantees have they given North Korea since the last uh, top meeting uh, and promises for the future and so on? Because it seems that after that top meeting, the process started. And isn't China's goal to throw out the Americans from the Chinese Sea completely? And that is the way if it's peace of the state of that. Thank you very much. Short comment from the panel. Who would like to start? I think what we, what we, what we know it for sure is, of course, uh, limited. But at least what comes out of the talks now is that China is actually receiving quite a lot of economic benefits from this. So North Korea is actively seeking China support again. Because um, for a while there, China sort of was out of the food. But then I think when Kim Jong-un, but is this also an indication maybe that the negotiations with the United States and um, North Korea is not going so well, that Kim Jong-un is seeking the support of Xi Jinping and saying, listen, the Americans are asking too much from us, support us. Xi Jinping, of course, says we would love to do that, and by the way, what can you give us? So I think we've seen the economic benefits for, for the Chinese again, especially in the mining districts of so northern part of North Korea. And China's role is growing. They are becoming much more active player. And I think that, and that in a sense contradicts uh, what I said before, but if there's bad relations between the United States and North Korea, China's role tends to become more important. And if things are moving very well, China's role might actually be slightly uh, less. But, from the North Korean position, there's absolutely no doubt about it. China is, will continue to be crucial. And when it comes to economic development and economic assistance, the two main sources are South Korea and China. And China is arguably even the more important of these. So without doubt, China has an enormous uh, stake at this. And then you talk about the geopolitical situation. That's why China now supports any form of peace agreement and any form of ending of the war, because that would reduce the um, uh, the benefits uh, of having U.S. troops. And the Fed system, arguably, they're not extremely effective against North Korean nuclear weapons, but against Chinese nuclear weapons, they would be much more effective. So I think we have to view this more geopolitical. And the Chinese are well aware of this. And they, they play into all the constantly. Well, uh, judging from the forest of raised hands for all, uh, open up, opening up the floor for, for questions, I see that, that Korea Center has a mission to organize more <laughs> seminars like this. But we have now run out of time. A uh, number of topics will still need to be, be addressed. But uh, I would like to thank the panel for so willingly sharing their experience expertise in these matters. Uh, I, don't, I can't say whether the question marks have been straightened, but at least uh, we have gotten a better understanding of the issues at stake. Thank you so much, panel, for your expertise.
just very quickly on behalf of ISDB, again, I'd like to echo what Pear said. Um, we, we thank the audience uh, for your questions, for coming here on a nice sunny day outside. Um, and uh, special thanks to our panelists and also uh, to the Korea Foundation for making this event possible today, for which we're very thankful. Uh, please look out on our website, isdb.eu, for future events. So, we, which, of which we hope to have many in the forthcoming months. Um, on a point of order, please feel free to stay and mingle for a little bit. I think there's still a bit more coffee. Uh, maybe you can answer, you can ask some of those uh, questions which haven't been answered yet uh, with each other. And for our panelists and special guests, we have uh, lunch upstairs at 12.30. Thank you very much again.